For many Canadians, the history of African Canadians is limited to the Underground Railroad. It's a history that some historians are working to expand upon, and one of those historians joins us now. Bulu Ibanda Deberry is the co-editor of The Promised Land, History and Historiography of the Black Experience in Chatham-Kent Settlements and Beyond. He's also a professor at the University of Ottawa. Hello. Hi, Pierre. Well, let's talk about our history. Uh, and a history, is, as I suggested there, that, that many of us don't know that much about. So first of all, set this up for me. The Promised Land Project, what is that? Oof, it was <laughs> huge. <laughs> you know, I'm not a historian, right? I'm a communication, media studies, and, uh, and cultural studies professor. But I, I got, like, uh, by accident, you know, into a into kind of historical uh, uh, um, basket, right? By accident, mm. right? And then um, I was traveling with my son. He's 15, so, so he's 10 years ago, traveling to southern part of Ontario. And then we were camping. Yeah, I have five kids, mm. one boy, right? <laughs> so we were camping. Yeah. And then, and then, so we arrive at this port called Chatham, and we met a 70, 79 years old at back then. And then this lady was lecturing me about black history in Chatham. Mm. Then I say, where is all this black? I don't see them. I was camping right around here. I don't see that many blacks. And then she was actually telling me a fascinating history. And then I, I realized that this particular history is unknown. Mm. You'd never heard this I've history. I've never heard about it. Yeah. Of course, you see, I speak my English with this uh, comic accent. I came from Africa a couple of years ago. I did all of my study here, and I have my son traveling with me, but I've never heard about this particular history. Um, but you know how I got fascinated? Is that that lady called Gwen Robinson told me about the story of a particular lady, another lady, called Marianne Chad Carey. And I know we're going to talk about her. And it is very interesting because I did my PhD in communication in one of the most feminist departments in the country, mm. Concordia University in Montreal. But I've never heard about Marianne Chad Carey. But you know what? Marianne Chad Carey was a journalist. Mm. So you, you, there is no way. They shouldn't you shouldn't have heard about absolutely. her. Absolutely. Right. There is no way you, I mean, I did history classes in, in, in communication in Canada, and there is no name. Nobody's name Chad Carey. And nobody, actually, Chad Carey could be also sound like being a white woman, mm. but she's not even named. Mm. Then I became f upset. And upset like, or obsessed? Obsessed yeah. by her. Who is that lady? Mm. I want to know more. And then I start to read a little bit more about the, the particularity of his, this, uh, this history. And you know what? Black history has been, as you said, has been in Canada, so to speak, has been limited to the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Right? That's all what we know. It's somehow romanticized. Mm. Yeah, but it's just very limited, as you okay, said. Okay, well, we'll break down myths and, and romanticization yeah. in a sec. So, and we'll talk about Marianne Shad Carey. Yeah. But the title is interesting, The Promised Land. Why is it called that? What's the reference to? Oh, what are you hell. trying to say with that? So The Promised Land is the story or the work of the people who created the idea of a promised land in Canada. These are wonderful communities wonderful individual and you know what we start in Ontario and if you continue with the title but it goes beyond mm -hmm. Ontario right we start in Chatham Ken which is a little area but you have my one of my research partner Handel talked about multiple trajectories of black moving on from west to east and we're talking about far east mm. and then we're talking about moving from Canada to Africa, right? Mm. Do you know that part of this mm. history? We're talking about moving from Canada to the Caribbean and back and forth. We're talking about multiple, a dozen of shift full of black people traveling from Nova Scotia to Africa. So the promised land is not the promised land that you think about. Mm. It's actually multiple locations. Mm. 
And this is part of the project. Absolutely. This is all trying to understand this vast history, it, this migration, why people move, what was promised in good ways, exactly. what the realities were in e not so good ways e exactly. as well. Exactly. And then when you ask, what is the pro Iceland, I said, I couldn't see any black. I mean, the amount of black that the historical books were talking about in Chatham, they're not there anymore. Mm. So the question, a good question would be, but where are they? Mm. Where, where are they now or today? Um, so they are in the promised lands, in multiple promised lands. So some of them, and actually majority of them, went back to, to the United States. Mm. Um, we, you mentioned this, and I, I, and I spoke a bit about it off the top, which is, um, I think most people's collective his understanding of history of the Black Canadian experience is connected to the Underground Railroad. And we've seen this narrative, um, you know, been talked about in books and in film. We're going to play, uh, this is a Heritage Minute, I want to play this. Um, these are these Heritage Minutes that, that we've had on TV for years. Yeah. This one is about the uh, Underground Railroad, so let's talk about that, and then we'll talk about what it's saying. Pa should have been here by now. He's three hours late already. Pa ain't gonna make it! One of them slave catchers got so much to happen, I just know Pa it. said you both made it past the border yesterday. We've all Ma. done this before. He's our Pa, he'll be here! <laughs> Come, let's pray. <laughs> no more prayers! Liza! Liza! Between 1840 and 1860, more than 30,000 American slaves came secretly to Canada and freedom. They called it the Underground Railroad. Lisa! Pa! 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 We're free! Yes, Pa, we're in Canada! There it is. That's a narrative we know, right? The the the. Canada, the beacon of, of freedom for, for, for slaves, the promised land. The dominant narrative. Uh -huh. Yeah. What's wrong with that narrative? How accurate is well, it? It's fine. Hmm. It's not there is nothing wrong with that. It's just limited. 18th century, 18th century, I have to go back. I do really have to go back. I do really have to play historian a little bit. Okay. Not being one. But you know what? We have to go back in the 17th century to talk about the presence of black in Canada, okay? We have record today that they have, these people have been here since 1600, okay? Matilda Costa. We can talk about those figures. Mm. These are Canadian, black Canadian historical figures. They have to be known, 1600. We, wa we have to talk about this group of black people, black loyalists. We have to talk about that. I knew very little about that. My son, he's graduating from, from middle school. He knew very little mm. about that. This is what we have to talk about. We have to full, we have to have our university uh, um, shelves of books with those stories multiple stories of wonderful individuals, pioneers, building community, doctors, Martin Delaney, Miriam Chad Carey, you name them, mm. tons of them. And again, I'm not a historian. I just got interested. Mm. I got into the mutual fund basket of history, right? And it is fascinating. It is really fascinating. There are this group of people who did wonderful work to build a community, and you know what? A multicultural community, because you're talking about black history, but you know, black history lots is of, Canadian history, yeah. right? Black history is a Canadian history. You have to understand, I do. Many years ago, I, I, I started to have this activity at my university where I invite students to talk about what is black history for them. And three years ago, a student of mine came out with this wonderful idea. Black history is a Canadian history and then created a wall of signature mm. that we have to remind that a white student I'm talking about. Black history is not black because of the color. It is a kind of minor history that always come into play to trouble the dominant history. This is what, this is what black history is. It is as now we're talking, there's something going on in the country right now. 
with Aboriginal schools, the schooling they went through, talking about cultural genocide. Black history is a kind of marginalized history that need to get to the center of Canadian history. And, and you suggested that when we, when we played the, the Underground Railroad tape there, that that, um, that was a limited understanding, and, and you talked about how the, the history predates all, all that. But that I, I want to stick with that for a minute, because the idea that is portrayed in the dominant narrative is that um, black people were free in Canada in the 19th century. That is factually, empirically wrong. Set the record straight then, if you would. They were slaves in Canada. You have to know about that. They were slaves in Canada. And, and you know, the narrative is always that, yes, but slavery wa in Canada wasn't like... Wasn't as bad as it was in the United that, States. Yeah. No, that, I don't want to play that game mm. of numbers, of systems. They were slaves in Canada, period. Mm. What I'm trying to say is this. Yes, the minutes, the heritage minutes are fine. They are limited. Canada, yes, there were a place, little doors, where slaves could run away. But there were also, and if you go to the sandwich back in uh, early, early 18th, 18th century or mid 18th century, in sandwich, just four hours down here in Windsor, you will see that back then, you know, slave runners were, slave catchers were actually going across the border because the border was in existence, mm. right? To catch slaves in, in around Windsor and, and Chatham, Kent's area. So there were slaves in Canada. That is something we have to learn about. Mm. There were slaves in Quebec. I'm not going to name anybody. There are well-known names, Canadian figures, who own slaves. Mm. You know, and they, they are well known, they own universities and stuff like that. Why don't right? you want to name them? No, because it's going to I mean, feel. I that's part of our history, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. It's going to feel as if we re re retaliate. This is not what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. My cultural analysis is that, okay, if somebody like McGill owns slaves, people have to know that McGill. University came from slave owners, right? Mm -hmm. This period, it's not that I'm trying to make something out of that. We have to understand the conversation. Actually, if we don't talk about it, the conversation won't. And, and, and you know, several black people play that game a lot. So several black intellectuals in Canada play that game of, of, of being, of, of, of um, thinking that they need to be, uh, they need to retaliate mm. somehow. Um, I want to get back to where we started this conversation. You go camping in Chatham, Kent area, and this woman tells you this story. And you, this gets you interested in uh, finding this history and, and revealing it. How would you characterize at, at Chatham, Kent in the 19th century when it comes to its black population? What were people doing? What were their jobs? How were they regarded? How many were there? <sighs> 40% of Chatham Kent population is known they were black people. 40%. 40. 40. Wow. Interesting, right? Interesting. Today, I don't think even if they are 10%. So, so this is another, hmm. another part of it. But Chatham Kent particularly because um, there is this um, abolitionist called John Brown who arrived to Chatham, right? So Chatham Kent was a wonderful headquarter of slaves and freedom fighters. This is how I'm going to call them. And now this has a kind of connotation to the, a freedom fighter mm -hmm. is a kind of terrorist, right? It's these guys were freedom fighters. So they created Chatham, because Chatham is, if you look at the map, Chatham is somehow 40, 40 minutes from, from Windsor and from the border. Yeah. And you have these two rivers. Actually, before we named the project Promised Land, we wanted to name it between the two rivers. Mm. But Ch because the thing that we, we found is that it was a safe haven, it's a, a place where they could talk, they could organize. Right? It was a kind of meeting point. So what we discover is that John Brown came to Chatham to organize the Harper's Ferries. I have the name now. The Harper's Ferries, um, because if you look at black history in, in the United States, you're going to see that uh, many of the freedom fighters came to Canada 
to organize, mm. to find alliances. And Chatham was one of those places where they used to go to look at people. And we're going to talk about Marianne Chatkari again, but she came also to Chatham and she saw that place and she said, wow, we need to bring more black people here. And you know what? We're talking about Chatham, Kent. And the county, we also have something called and this is quite funny because Uncle Tom Cabins, which is a wonderful kind of um, romanticized mm. history. The cabin is here in Dresden. Please take your kids to the cabin. <laughs> wonderful. Mm. Henson's, Henson's Tom's and families are there. These are early black pioneers. pioneers in that particular region of the country. And as let, let's talk about, because she, her name's come up quite a few times, Mary Ann Shad Carey. Yeah. So who was she? She's a journalist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about her. Business woman. Yeah. Journalist. We talk, okay, now I have, to, I have to go back to the context because it's easy to say a journalist, right? We are in the 21st century. It's sure. easy to say a woman journalist. It's easy to say. We're talking about a lady, one, she's black, Two, she doesn't have any citizenship rights whatsoever. So you have to replace her or position her within that historical context, right, of nobody, mm. period, mm. right? And then she arrives in, Wins in Windsor, around Toronto here. The first thing she, do, she did is to create a school an integrated school for all races. So for me, as a cultural studies specialist, when I read that, my first question is, why does she need to create an integrated school mm. for all kids, right? Canada was a free country. Everybody could enjoy the, the schooling system uh, and the, the public system. So one of the arguments that back then in 18, early 1820s, there were no public system. Fine. But there were churches. There were church all around the country, right, running the school. Mm. Why not integrating the school system of the church? But she found, she created new schools. And she was talking about integrated school back in 1850 in Canada. Mm. I just want to jump ahead because this is quite interesting. A couple of years ago, particularly in Ontario here, we were talking about Afrocentric school. Yes. You know what? Disintegrated school where black people have to learn because they're failing too much in the public system. They have to learn about. And Chad Carey, couple of decades ago, was already talking about integrated schools. So this is, this is what, Chad Carey was a wonderful, visionary lady, mm. a businesswoman. She worked so much on Canada's nation building. And this lady needs to be recognized. She started a newspaper as well. Newspaper, editor, mm -hmm. and writers. So she, she's, she was a founder. She was editing, she was writing. The Provincial Freeman. And you know what she was writing about? She was inviting blacks to come to Canada. And one of her key argument is that black will have a better place in Canada than in the United States. But you know what? She end up living, going back to the United States. She tear up back then, 15 years later, as can her Canadian passport, right? So we're talking about wonderful intellectuals black intellectuals that were working to build what we call today the multicultural so nation. Let's, I mean, the point is that we don't know these history. We don't need these people that helped build our country and, and, and our province, and, and, um, and we need to know them better. This, this collective history has been put to the margin. But bring it in to, you know, 2015 now. Um, 
aside from us, I don't want to say aside from us, but not knowing these people, what what are we to, what do we need to learn about what they gave to this country, how they built this province? Do more research like this, like the promised land, allow allowed and and. And invite young students to learn about it, um, create tools, books, write more, more, more books. The Promo Island was a wonderful seven years adventures, thanks to Social Science and University Research Council. It was a funded project. It was, we got about $1 million to do the research, okay? Well, some of the, I mean, if I look at the, the numbers, we have 1,000 conferences going around the countries, going to the Caribbean to talk about the place of black Canadian. Actually, it is about the participation of also of Canada in the transatlantic history, mm -hmm. in the global history. This is how you connect. So if you don't talk about it, how are you going to connect Canada to that particularity of this world history? Uh, the promised land was, um, so I was saying thank to, thanks to uh, social science and humanity who was able to help us articulate this project. But um, you have to do more. You know, I heard, I heard this again and again, that, but we don't have the data. We don't have the, we don't have any data mm. about these people. So teacher, particularly school teacher, talks about talked about um, not having the data, not knowing about this particular right. history, where to start. Yeah, we hear these parallels when we're talking about residential school history. Exactly, right. where to start. You know what? Start with an individual brings your student to dress them to visit the cabin, take them to heritage room in Chatham, take them to a trip in Halifax. Although this is another, another problem because if you go, if you travel to these places, you're going to see little plaque, little writings, like we're still in the margin. We need monuments, right? We need to build monuments about these people because they are part of the heritage, the national heritage. They need to have, they need to be part of the Canadian museum that was of civilizations. Mm. Not civilizations, but civilization, which is recalled Canadian Museum of History. They need to get into that museum mm. because then you as a teacher, you can bring your, your kids, your children to, to your student in there and talk about that, start teaching about that. We need to do more research. Mm. We need to do a lot more research because we have at this point, and, and there are wonderful people in Canada, wonderful people doing wonderful research on this cultural history but it's still very limited. And this research, I want to, and this is a statement, it's not a black research. This is a statement, you know, this is a Canadian research. Black studies is absolutely not, if totally absent in Canadian studies. Black history or black studies Let has to be, Let me ask you this be, though, yes. do, do you think it's a, a deliberate omission or, a, a, or born of ignorance? Or so, Pia, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I have an answer. I wish I have an answer. A clear cut, laconic answer that maybe yes. Mm. No, I don't. I think there is something. There is something I discovered doing this research is that even in Chatham, it is very tough to get people to talk about their heritage. And most of black people in Chatham, they are mixed with white people. We have to be able to talk about those multiplicities of identities that makes us, mm. right? We have to be able to talk about the mingling between native Canadian, First Nation, and black. We have to be able to talk about, uh, not that there is always a racial kind of uh, um, uh, commerce dots around there. We have to be able to, to talk about it openly. And then, and then we have to be able to get above the ownership of our history because this is an issue. I, in the book I talk about, about cultural authorities. These are people who they believe they own that particular, the particularity of this history. Which is wrong. So if you, if you own it, if you, if you don't bring it out there, what's the point? There are many, many elements of this history that need to get out of the basement of many peoples I still know today. Mm. Right? This is the issue. This is an issue. So, so 
go back to your, to, 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 if I have to say one. Well, I'm not saying you have to. I'm just integrate, saying. integrate those individuals into mm -hmm. the grand narrative. Integrate them into, um, into the museum. Of, of Canadian Museum of History, integrate them into the schooling system, right? Take your student to Dresden, to Chatham, to Nova Scotia, but to British Columbia as well, right? Where, by the way, the first Canadian governor was black man, right? We don't know, but we have to talk about this. You know, Canadian history is somehow racialized because it's all white, right? It is all white, and we don't seem to see models from other parts of the world. But we talk about multiculturalism. But multiculturalism did, did not start in the 80s. Hmm. It started long ago, you know? So, so it's more than politics. It's, it's about intellectual knowledge. It's about cultural heritage, right? It's more about more, more than politics, more. Thank you um, for introducing many people to this part of our history and then for helping build our collective history and documenting it. I appreciate talking to you today. <laughs> Thank you very much, B. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.